distinguished panel of witnesses for joining us here this evening. Lieutenant General McMaster, the success of Ukraine, NATO, and the principle of the rule of law against Vladimir Putin and his illegal war is a great cautionary tale for Xi Jinping and his stated desire to invade Taiwan. But for all the success of the West in Ukraine, we have to admit that deterrence failed. So in the Pacific, we can't afford to let deterrence fail. How do we prevent that from happening? Like Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping seems to believe his own propaganda. So how do we make our powerful deterrent believable to Xi and the Chinese Communist Party so that they don't draw us into war? Carson Mullen, thank, thank you for that question. I, I think it's through strength, obviously. It, peace through strength still works. And that's, the, that's our defensive capabilities and those of our partners and allies in, in the region. I think it's immensely encouraging that Japan is doubling its defense in investment. I think new formats that, that, that encourage defense cooperation, like AUKUS, very encouraging. But I think we have to recognize that we are very far behind. If you remember the run-up to the, to the, to the reinvasion of Ukraine, many people thought, well, we just need to lay out our red lines. We just need to allay Putin's security concerns. But this is a narcissistic view of the world in which we think what we do or what we say is decisive toward achieving the favorable outcome. But both Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have aspirations that go far beyond those that are in reaction to us. And so therefore, it's important for us to demonstrate the strength necessary to convince Xi Jinping, leaders in that party, and leaders in the People's Liberation Army that they cannot accomplish their objectives through the use of force. I think you know, the, the modernization efforts that are ongoing are inadequate, but the direction in policy is starting to turn in the right direction. For example, uh, some basing activity uh, so that we can project power more readily back to the Philippines, for example. So, so one of our most powerful components, one of the most powerful components of our strength, as clearly demonstrated in Europe, is our partners and our partnerships. But they're not as developed in the Pacific. So you just mentioned the Philippines. What do we need to do to strengthen our allies and their partnership with us? Well, uh, Congressman Moulton, I think, first of all, we ought to thank Xi Jinping because he's really helping us in this, con in this connection uh, with his brazen aggression from the Himalayan frontier to the South China Sea to 1,771 violations of Taiwan's air defense identification zone just last year, many other violations oriented on Japan, on South Korea. And what you would typically hear from our friends in the Indo-Pacific region oftentimes is that, hey, don't force us to choose. Don't force us to choose between Washington and Beijing. But I think it is, being clear, it is becoming clear to, to countries in the region that it's not a choice between Washington and Beijing. It's a choice between sovereignty and servitude. And I think that we see that especially in this vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific, which we owe to the late Prime Minister Abe. And I think that that is building momentum. You know, China has it on one belt, one road, but, you know, we are on the side of many belts, many roads. Mr. Pottinger, what are some of Xi's vulnerabilities? Well, I, I think one useful statistic to keep in mind is that China is in spending more on its military than the rest of Asia combined, and yet that number is still smaller than the amount of money that Xi Jinping is spending on his domestic security apparatus to surveil and oppress his own people. So, uh, so it really is fear of his own people. It's fear of losing access to our capital markets. Uh, they, he, he, another vulnerability for him would be lo losing access to American technology. It's clear that, that, uh, that China has not yet achieved the self-sufficiency, self-reliance that, that he wants to achieve so that he can wield that as a coercive leverage against other countries. So we should not make it so easy. I, I mean, imagine if we were actually taking more than the baby steps that I think we've taken in the right direction and, and actually made the Chinese Communist Party sweat for a change, to actually have to fight uh, to try to achieve its vision rather than, than serving it up on a silver platter. But more than anything else, he's fearful of his own people. If you remember when he just had a, a party congress where Xi Jinping gave himself, uh, awarded himself a second decade in power, um, he had his predecessor walked out uh, of, of the proceedings 
and then announced, perhaps uh, secretly at first, had arranged secretly for only uh, loyalists to be elevated to the Politburo, the Standing Committee uh, uh, of the Politburo. So he fears people within his party too. He fears factions. He fears any kind of dissent uh, or, or even constructive criticism at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. LaHood is recognized.